Good morning and welcome to Grace. Yesterday was a very special day. It's my brother-in-law's birthday yesterday. Uh, So happy birthday, Mike, if you're listening right now. Um, He certainly has been through quite a bit in these last couple weeks. And so we continue to pray for you. Our church continues to pray for you. And we're thinking about you, Mike. Well, Lawrence Peter Barra, perhaps you've heard of him as Yogi Berra. He's this famous New York Yankees baseball catcher. He became a manager, a coach, and a Hall of Famer, actually, who is known for his famous one-liners that had come to be known as yogiisms. And this is true. And so I want to share with you some of his most memorable yogiisms. It was Yogi who first said, You can observe a lot by watching. He also had said, Uh, once about a restaurant that he used to go to often, he goes, nobody goes there anymore. It's too crowded. And then another thing that uh, I thought was uh, pretty fun to share with you, he says, when you come to a fork in the road, take it. But probably one of the best ones of his one-liners is when Yogi witnessed uh, Mickey Mantle was and Roger uh, Mars who hit a two back-to-back home runs on this on one season in the 1960s. And after watching this, he had famously said, it's deja vu all over again. Well, obviously deja vu is the feeling that you've lived through something uh, that you're experiencing in the present. And so it's this present situation that you're in, and you feel like you've done that same thing before. So what Yogi was essentially saying, he was saying the same thing twice here. And so you can see some of his comments there. They're pretty interesting, (laughs) to say the least. But in today's passage, you might find yourself experiencing a little bit of deja vu all over again. Uh, Certainly it's a feeling that I've had in my recent past. Uh, Most of you guys know I had some, uh, a couple weird episodes where I experienced extreme deja vu. And uh, it, it, today, <laughs> you could almost share that when you think about Jesus feeding a multi, uh, multitude of people. And so as we continue our expository journey through the Gospel of Mark, we find ourselves really beginning chapter 8. And uh, the first 13 verses is where I want to spend our time this morning. This is actually the latter part of a longer section if you look back in chapter 6, 6 to 8. Uh, where there, Mark here is he, he's contrasting failure with faith. He has this pattern of failure, faith, failure of the disciples. Uh, they experience some failure, something that they uh, are, come short of, woefully short. Then they experience great faith and failure again. So here, as in uh, chapter 6 and 7, there's this uh, another feeding uh, miracle that leads into the failure of the disciples as linked with the Pharisees. But this time, Mark reverses the order uh, with which Jesus is using the analogy of the bread uh, to warn against yeast or spreading evil, the evil of the Pharisees. So let's go ahead and read this together, starting at verse 1 of chapter 8. It says this, In those days, when again a great crowd had gathered and they had nothing to eat, he called his disciples to him and said to them, I have compassion on the crowd because they have been with me now three days and and have nothing to eat. And if I send them away hungry to their homes, they will faint on the way. And some of them have come from far away. And his disciples answered him, how can one feed these people with bread here in this desolate place? And he asked them, that's Jesus. Jesus asked them, how many loaves do you have? They said, seven. And he directed the crowd to sit down on the ground. And he took the seven loaves, and having given thanks, he broke them and gave them to his disciples to set before the people, and they set them before the crowd. And they had a few small fish, and having blessed them, he said that these also should be set before them. And they ate and were satisfied, and they took up the broken pieces left, over seven baskets full. And there were about 4,000 people, and he sent them away. And immediately he got into the boat with his disciples and went to the district of Dalmanthua. And the Pharisees came and began to argue with him, seeking from him a sign from heaven, 
to test him. Verse 12, and he sighed deeply in his spirit and said, why does this generation seek a sign? Truly, I say to you, no sign will be given to this generation. Then verse 13, this is actually where I want to stop this morning. And he left them, got into the boat again, and went to the other side. And as you read this, and perhaps you're thinking of chapter 6, where uh, Mark talks about the first feeding of the crowd, you see differences and details that distinguish this miracle from the feeding that we had seen last time quite a few weeks back. At that time, in chapter 6, uh, it was those 5,000 that were fed were mostly Jews. This time, um, Jesus ministered to a mixed crowd of Jews and Gentiles in this predominantly Gentile region of the Ten Towns, the Decapolis, you might recall. And Jesus also began with the quantities of bread and fish, and he did not require his uh, disciples to admit their own inability to solve the problem. The primary addition here in the second time, though, is that uh, this is extended to the Gentiles. Even in Israel, Jesus did take the gospel to a mixed audience. Um, Jesus' actions and teachings did indeed have a significant impact on the Gentile region. And Mark and his original readers, uh, he's, he's thinking of these as he's writing. His, who his original audience was was primarily Roman. He had them in mind when he recorded these miracles. So Jesus' compassionate ministry to non-Jews would be a very an appealing story for the Roman audience who Mark's writing to. So one new theme that we see from this section, the second feeding, uh, concerns the serious danger of putting God to the test. And I want to talk about that a little bit more as we develop this, uh, these passages. Uh, but Jesus was ministering in the region of the, uh, the Decapolis. So let's see how he was ministering what was then the secular world of his day. How do we minister to our world? Well, first off, Jesus... He had a concern. He had a genuine concern for the world around him. And Jesus had just healed a deaf uh, and demon-possessed little girl, as we saw uh, a deaf man before, and uh, this demon-possessed girl from last week we saw. And it comes to, then as no surprise that this great crowd gathers again. So as Jesus ministers to the world, crowds do gather. And many details uh, between the, the first feeding in chapter 6 and now seem the same. And in fact, some people think that it is such same details of the feeding miracle that uh, some people believe really this is just a copy of the earlier story. And while there are many similarities we could point to, and also if this was the same exact story retold again, it would explain why the disciples are acting ignorant <laughs> Uh, as we saw in verse 4. Uh, however, there's no reason to believe that this is a mere duplicate story. And probability alone suggests that Jesus repeated healings, as he uh, repeated healings we've already seen, repeated exorcisms. Uh, these miracles were repeated in his ministry. So why wouldn't he repeat this one as well? And then uh, Mark would certainly be a poor editor if he simply just took another story from chapter 6 and changed a few details and tried to pass it off as a new version uh, to the Gentiles, uh, the same story. Certainly that would have been cross-referenced in the old, uh, you know, in the first century church, and they would have been able to see that this is a lie, so Mark wouldn't do that. Uh, it makes way more sense if this second miracle really just happened as Mark is recording it. And to kind of prove this point, in verses 19 through 21 in Mark chapter 8, we haven't read that yet, but Jesus considers them as separate events and distinguishes between them from each other. So Jesus certainly believes that this is two different accounts. He goes on to verse 2, I have compassion on the crowds. Jesus' compassion here, it's physical. It's centering on the effects of their hunger. Back in the first feeding, his compassion was really more of a, a spiritual concern due to the, uh, the failure of their leaders, their shepherds, if you look back in chapter 6. But now it's more physical. He, he says they had been with him for three days already. And the fact that they were willing to remain with him for these three days uh, without uh, sufficient provisions really attests to the fact that they have spiritual hunger for Jesus, and Jesus is now wanting to meet a physical need of theirs. 
And Jesus' concern really crosses all boundaries, as we see in verse 3, the ethnic uh, distinctions. He says, if I send them away hungry to their homes, they will uh, give out on the way, pass out, you know, in some translations. This is Lexham English Bible here, but give out on the way. And some of them have come from far away. He's concerned not only of just those um, that he's comfortable with, he's familiar with, he's, he's concerned about everybody. In verse 4, his disciples answered him, where is anyone able to find, uh, sorry, excuse me, feed rather these people with bread here in the desert? Uh, The disciples' failure really to expect Jesus to do a miracle again really does match chapter 6. If you look at verse 37, they they ask pretty much the same question. And so it does seem strange, I admit, in light of the fact that Jesus, just a short time earlier, had in, indeed miraculously fed a similar larger crowd, why do the disciples here not seem to be aware of the possibility of Jesus performing such a miracle again? I don't know if you had thought about that as you read this. And as you think about the answer to that question, I want to give you this at least. Uh, <laughs> this is exactly how all of us seem to react to Jesus today. We understand and expect little even after Jesus meets our needs again and again. We forget uh, Christ's past work in our own lives, the miracles he's performed for me in my life, when I come up to a new situation, a new burden, and I wonder how in the world is this going to be solved? As if Jesus changed and, or his attitude changed or he's just not able So really, this failure to synthesize and learn wisdom, whether it be us or the disciples, it it follows you. And certainly, we know it follows the disciples through the rest of this gospel as a part of their hardness of heart, which Jesus again says in verses 17 through 19. But uh, the disciples, their lack of faith here could also be because of the Gentile location. So for those that think that this might be a copy of the first and would look at that as proof that the disciples don't know that Jesus could do this miracle, not necessarily because this uh, Gentile region, uh, the disciples aren't anticipating Gentiles being able to participate in messianic blessings, or you could even say at this point, the messianic banquet. And nowhere in the nearby area can they find enough food to satisfy the needs of all these people and they're thinking God, or Jesus here does miracles just for the Jews. But certainly the lesson that comes from this is pretty clear. And it's as clear as the first time he fed the group of 5,000. Only Jesus has the resources to solve their problems. And so he takes command. And that's the second part of our uh, outline here. In this instance, when the disciples check with the crowds, uh, seven loaves were found. Yet the disciples were completely perplexed. They're like, this isn't going to work. And like these disciples, we forget God's provision. And it's easy for us to look at our own resources today and say, I can't do this. I can't serve God because he hasn't given me this yet or this first. Maybe we're, I can't give to the church because God hasn't given me enough money yet. And that kind of mindset fails, just as it did here in our passage. So Jesus, Jesus asks them, how many loaves do you have? And so they said seven. You notice that we've already seen a few numbers. Uh, there's the, the three days that the crowd is with them, and many scholars see uh, numerological significance in the numbers of, these story, uh, of this account here. And certainly I do think there is something to the fact that we see very common numbers, three, the Trinity, seven, Seems to be more of like a completeness or perfection. Six, or 666, as we read about in Revelation, is something less than, falls short of perfection. And then three days where uh, the death and resurrection of Christ, and certainly these, uh, there is some correlation here of the same number. But I don't know that there's any need for us to try to allegorize uh, or bring out some symbolism to this these numbers. For one, it's not told overtly that these numbers mean anything more than they're just simply the numbers that were present uh, during this time. And 
the overall emphasis of this passage is what had happened, not the number of things that had happened. So uh, from an insignificant amount of bread and fish, Jesus is able to create this satisfying feast for everybody. And I do admit there could be still some numerological significance in the 12, uh, the 12 and 7 baskets of the fragments. And it yeah, certainly does point to the perfection or the complete work of God through Jesus in this miracle. But to take it much further than that, I really don't know that it would warrant that. And so in verse 6, he says, He commanded the crowd to recline for a meal on the ground, or in some translations, to sit down on the ground. But it's interesting here in the uh, Lexham English, it, it does use the word recline for a meal. If you recall back in chapter 6, uh, they sat in groups of hundreds and in fifties in that feeding. And we had talked about there could be this military connotation as you look in the Old Testament um, at the, at the groups of hundreds and fifties of how the military was divided. And so, uh, and that was like a picture we had talked about, actually, if you remember, of this messianic army feasting with their Messiah, their king. And here, this is a Greco-Roman culture. And it was uh, a, a part of their culture to recline at a banquet or be invited to be part of, really, the family who is eating. So... When he had taken the seven loaves and given thanks, he broke it and gave them to his disciples. And as in uh, chapter 6, there may have been uh, some kind of communion nuance here, as the same language that occurs at the Last Supper that we see in Mark in chapter 14, or in other parts of the scripture, um, these two feeding miracles have really rich theological uh, depth to them. And more so, perhaps, than many of the other miracles we read, uh, wrote, read about already. And in a sense, you could see this as recreating, perhaps, uh, somewhat like the ma uh, manna that fell from the sky in the wilderness in Exodus chapter 16, as well as Elisha's multiplication of the loaves that we saw in 2 Kings chapter 4 when we last time looked at chapter 6 then uh, this future orientation, really, of looking forward to the Last Supper and the Messianic banquet that spoke about in uh, Revelation. And so the promise is that God will provide for his people and give them an overabundance of blessings. In uh, verse 8 here, they ate and they were satisfied. We saw back in chapter 6, both of these feeding miracles, the people were completely satisfied. And so much so that Mark uh, makes note of that. And he, he's certain to include that, that they were satisfied. And uh, in the word here, actually, in the Greek, it's expressed with this very strong Greek verb, meaning that they were stuffed completely full to almost overflowing. So the picture is this lavish banquet almost uh, in which the participants really gorge in this overabundance of food. The great amount of leftovers attests further to this. And as the average meal, a family would not have enough food uh, to have any leftovers at all. And here Jesus not only takes the small amount, but he makes it so that there's so much leftovers. And as we had talked about in chapter 6, the fact that the 12 and the 7 baskets, the fragments, uh, really points to this perfect meal that satisfies. And that's good news. Not only does Jesus provide for us, but he provides to the point of total satisfaction. It's easy for us to place our security in money or our security in land or our security in you know, our efforts. But none of those ultimately satisfy. They might satisfy for a moment or a time, but they don't satisfy forever. It's only Jesus who does this, and it's shown through the language. And then about... Verse 9, there were about 4,000 people. Again, as before, the Greek word here used for people is anderis, as opposed to anthropos, and that really means uh, male individuals. These are specific men that are talking about, not men, women, and children, but men. So again, uh, there were 4,000 men, but we could add to this number the women and the children who were there in the crowds, and that's a Jewish tradition to count the men. 
So Jesus had been able to escape really up to this point, the, the probing Pharisees for a while as he went through the Gentile areas uh, back in chapter 7 and now here in chapter 8. And his last dealing with them had involved the issue of the law and ceremonial defilement. And Jesus had called the Pharisees hypocrites back in chapter 7, verse 6. So uh, the Pharisees weren't going to give up on their relentless attempts to discredit Jesus before the crowds. So they constantly demand proof, even when more, uh, even more so, actually I should say, uh, that they had already seen. And that's sad. It's like, did Jesus not do enough? And so we can anticipate similar tactics in our own efforts when we communicate the gospel and live out the Christ-centered life. People keep demanding proof. They constantly demand proof. And so we might be asked to prove ourselves and prove the existence of God. And when we have that kind of approach uh, to us, uh, people are rarely honest. They don't really want us to prove God. Their, their attempts is to de derail us in our message that we carry as Christ followers. And though Jesus was constantly under attack, he always received those who were genuine seekers. But he does seem to almost push away, in a sense, those who were not looking to seek after him. And so these people, these, uh, these people who reject the truth, they demand proof. And like the ones here in front of Jesus, uh, uh, they're usually really smoke screens to cover up their, their adamant refusal to believe. And in Scripture, it says this in verse 11, the Pharisees came and began to argue with him, demanding from him a sign from heaven in order to test him. So, yes, the, the Pharisees have audacity to uh, test God in flesh. But it, you could also argue it was a valid thing to test a prophet to see if he had come from God or if he was a false prophet. This goes back all the way back to Deuteronomy. And perhaps they regarded it, uh, his other miracles as random chance occurrences or some natural way to explain it that they haven't figured out yet. But they used Deuteronomy, specifically chapters 13 and chapter 18, against Jesus and they, the Pharisees were trying to draw Jesus really into a trap. If he couldn't produce a sign that satisfied them, then they were going to accuse him of being a false prophet. But the sad thing is, they've already seen signs. They already heard about the testimony of witnesses to, to raising people from the dead and casting out demons and healing blind and deaf people. But somehow that was not enough. And I beg to say, some of us have talked to people today, and as we pour out our testimony, we uh, testify to the miracles God has done in our own lives. It's not enough for them. And they might see the changed life of an unbeliever, then when he accepts Christ, he's a new creature. He's repented of his past. He's changed. And that's a miracle. But it's a miracle that some will deny, and therefore no sign could be given to them that they would believe. The first part here, verse 11, the Pharisees came and began to argue, shows that they were not seeking truth. They wanted a fight. And so there's no openness to the possibility that God had sent his son Jesus, Emmanuel, as we get into the Christmas season, God with us. Instead, they wanted to only denounce him and turn other people against him. And this demand for a sign from heaven wasn't like, oh yes, we just need one more and we'll believe. No. They've already rejected Jesus' miracles for proof of his validity. So it's not a nature, a nature miracle or an exorcism that they're demanding here. They couldn't actually disprove and deny that Jesus had performed miracles before. And in fact, they couldn't do it so much that they had blamed it on Satan. Uh, in chapter 3, if you recall, they blamed Jesus that he had the, the power of Satan, and that's how he's performing his miracles. So rather, they're looking for this heavenly voice from Yahweh, the Father himself, or something as grand as that to say, stop it, this is my son, stop bothering him, believe in him. And 
really, I, I want you to see here that there's no problem in requesting a sign from God when it's genuine, is this you, Lord? But the problem comes when it's a negative intent. I am going to disprove God himself. Even though they wouldn't have uh, worded it like that, that's essentially what they're doing. So the disciples actually will gra- uh, ask for a sign Later in Mark, in Mark chapter 13, we're not there yet, but we'll get there eventually, sometime next year. But uh, these disciples ask for a sign, and Jesus gives it to them. And so we know it's not the fact of just asking God to confirm his greatness that's wrong. No, it's asking God to prove himself because you don't believe. That makes it so terrible. Verse 12, signed deeply in his spirit, he said, Why does this generation demand a sign? Truly, I say to you, no sign will be given. In fact, actually, this is not the first time. Uh, At least six places, if you take all the gospel accounts, uh, Jesus' audience asks him to show them a specific sign. They request for a sign, and apparently it's fairly regular occurrence as you look at the different uh, gospels. During Jesus' ministry, people wanted proof. And Jesus did supply signs. In fact, uh, the Gospel of John is full of them, and he calls them sign, uh, and and it's really a sign to point to the Father and to uh, Jesus' deity. Jesus is God. It's to help create faith where there was openness uh, for it, or uh, bolster weak faith, perhaps. But Jesus will never work signs on demand. Uh, just to pacify skeptics. And perhaps you had thought before in your witnessing as you talk to other people about the love of God in Christ, and they say, well, if God would just talk to me, well, if I could see him move that mountain, I would believe. And it's that kind of demand God will never satisfy. And I've been guilty in the past of thinking, God, if you would just do this for this person, they would believe. The answer is no, they wouldn't. Even if a mountain did move all of a sudden, they would believe something different. Like, oh, that was just chance. That was a volcano. That was, who knows, Satan. And so the sign is not going to be given to them. The sign that they do get, actually, that is given, is that of Jonah. (laughs) And it's not the sign they're looking for. It's not uh, what they, proof that they sought for. And Jesus, he sighs deeply again. We already read this in verse 34 of the previous chapter. This indicates Jesus' deep emotions as he continues on relentlessly. As he responds, in his complete reliance on God as he confronts the evil of these Pharisees. And this continual rejection by those who should have been the most able and eager to recognize him, deeply distress him, distress Jesus. So this generation... It extends the problem to the whole of Israel and likens them to a specific evil generation. And perhaps as in the days of Noah, Genesis chapter 7, during, during the wilderness wanderings it's compared to in Psalm 95. This generation, represented by these stubborn religious leaders, would ask for a sign. And they had already seen sign after sign, miracle after miracle, and heard incredible life-changing teachings. Something that the, the common man could see has more authority. But they choose to still reject Jesus. And so he knew that if he could have done any type of spectacular cosmic miracle, they would still continue in disbelief. They had already chosen not to believe Jesus. Verse 13, this is the result. He left them. In the Gospel of Mark, Jesus leaving a group is often really seen more uh, forceful, like a prophetic act of dismissal and rejection. Jesus wants nothing more to do with them at this time. And he crosses over the lake, and really this marks the end of his ministry to the Gentiles. So what? So Jesus did not come to earth to convince people to come to him by performing wonders. 
He did come to the earth, inviting people to come to him in faith. And as a response to their faith, he did perform great miracles. But for the self-righteous leaders, the religious leaders of that day, which extends to today, there's little hope. Certainly, we do not demand that God work in this world by our own criteria. Rather, we yield to his wisdom and his sovereignty in our lives. In other words, we do not tell God how to act. Instead, we act the way he tells us, and we conduct our lives accordingly. And so, with this ending of Jesus' public ministry to the region of Galilee, I, I want to see the four lessons we could take away. First, God's care for us is amazing. <laughs> it, it, it is really miraculous. Jesus' ministry was motivated, uh, motivated by his care for the people and his care for his disciples. 1 Peter 5, 7 says, casting all your cares on him. Why? Because he cares for you. All of life's anxieties can be thrown on God. Why? Because he loves you. He cares for you. He will take over. And so the basis is God's amazing love for us, his care for us. And as we groan in the midst of our worries, our troubles, we must admit that we cannot know God's will in every situation as we pray. But the Spirit groans, as Scripture says, for our difficulties more deeply than we do and we can understand and ensures that all things work together for good. And so in every situation, we can know that God is at work guiding and empowering our lives. The second thing I want you to see here is God is at work even when we fail. The disciples constantly failed to understand what was happening. Yet Jesus still worked in them and through them. And that is, that is good news. Even when I mess up, God can still use me. The disciples here were not up to the task in the miracle of the feeding of the 4,000. They, they again questioned Jesus, what are we going to do? And even after the earlier miracle of Jesus feeding a crowd, the disciples still don't know what to do. They failed the test. Yet God still uses them. Jesus still used them. And what an encouragement to all of us who follow Jesus, when you mess up, that's not the end. It doesn't have to be the end. You get back up, and you go at it again. God is not dependent on us. He doesn't need us. But at the same time, he wants us, and he wants to use us. And we are privileged to be used by him. We are finite creatures with finite bodies, yet God has placed his treasures in us and allowed us to distribute his wonderful grace gifts to others. And when we are weak and inadequate, we can still rejoice in our very areas of weakness because in them, God's power is more evident as the Apostle Paul states in his books, especially to the Corinthian church. You look at First and Second Corinthians. When we fail, God will never fail. The third thing I want you to see is putting God to the test is dangerous and stupid. The Pharisees did try to force their definition of what God is. God in the flesh who refuses to be limited by human ideologies. And so their far, false view of truth led them to make demands of God that brought his wrath down on upon them. In so doing, they repl really replicated the errors of Israel in the wilderness. If we look at Hebrews chapter 3, and there's a couple of passages I do actually want to look at. Uh, Hebrews chapter 3 and, uh, and 4, they're basic warnings against sinful unbelief in result of disobedience. In so doing, the ancient Israelites and the current Pharisees in our passage experience his wrath as they fail to enter into his rest. And that's the, the rest in the Old Testament, the promised land in Numbers, and then eternal life, as the New Testament states, and certainly in the book of Hebrews. And so he, Hebrews chapter 4 warns the reader to obediently uh, live in fear, lest we miss God's Sabbath rest, this eternal rest with God. In 4.11, especially verse 11, and that's what I want to show you, 
make every effort to enter that rest. It says, therefore, let us make every effort to enter into that rest in order that no one may fall in the same pattern of disobedience. The solution is to enter that rest, eternal life. God wants you. Fourth thing is approach God his way and do not demand what God will not give. Back in chapter 3, the Pharisees are described as having hardened hearts because they rejected God's work in Jesus. And here that rejection means both the refusal to accept Jesus' miraculous, literally miraculous ministry, and stemming from God and a demand that God sends a supernatural sign from heaven that alone would suffice as proof. But they expect God to answer on their terms and give it into their own requirements. And that they should have read their scriptures perhaps a little more closely. God never surrenders to human demands. But he does answer human requests as we yield to his demands. Again, in Hebrews, in chapter 4 now, I want to look at chapter 12. Verse 3 says this, For consider the one who endured such hostility by sinners against himself, so that you will not grow weary in your souls and give up. Give up what? The race (laughs) that's marked out for us. We must run the race of the Christian life. And we must never tell God how we wish to live that life. Wisdom found both in the Old Testament and the New Testament is living in life or living our lives in God's world on the basis of God's rules. And Jesus refused to fulfill their stipulations. And God will refuse anyone who takes such an arrogant approach to him. So in conclusion, God loves us. He takes wondrous care of his followers. And he wants you to follow after him wholeheartedly. And God is on, at work on our behalf in spite of our failures to understand him and always trust him. As Christians, as saved, changed people brought from spiritual complete death to life, we mess up. We still sin in our sin-cursed bodies in the sin-cursed earth. But it doesn't mean that it immediately disqualifies you ever from serving God again. Yes, there needs to be repentance before you get back in serving God. I'm not saying that you, you mess up in front of ministry and, oh, well, who cares? No, you repent. You get right with God and you move on. It's not the end of ministry. And that's good news. We must approach God his way and come to him on his terms instead of demanding and putting God to the test. That's what this passage means to me. So let's pray. Lord, I thank you for this passage and what it means today. Lord, forgive us in our lack of belief or lack of faith. And how easily we forget even things you've done recent in our lives. It causes us to doubt you. Lord, I pray as our church continues strong in ministry, to minister to this community, that you would bless us. You would continue to use us. And that we would love you. Lord, help none of us here to be anything like these Pharisees. And those who choose disbelief and demand things from you. I pray if there's anyone here that has been like that, or anyone listening online right now, who's demanded from you that they would repent, they would trust on your terms who you are, not who they want you to be. that you would forgive them. Today would be the day of salvation for them. We love you and we praise you. In your son's precious name, in Jesus' name. 
Amen. I thank you for joining us. Uh, Certainly, if you prayed that prayer, let me know. Uh, Stop me before I leave this morning, or if you're listening online, go ahead and call us at 906-771-5851 and let me know. And if this was a blessing to you, let us know. If you're here this morning, uh, certainly you know that the offering boxes are in the back, um, or if you're at home and you couldn't make it, you could certainly mail in your offering to help support us so that we can continue strong giving the word in this community and in this world. So certainly you can mail checks to 1295 Pyle Drive, P-Y-L-E Drive in Kingsford, Michigan, 49802. Or there's the online option, of course, you could go to our website, gracekingsford.org and slash give or at the first landing page of gracekingsford.org towards the bottom there's a part where you can give to our ministry Uh, and there's even texting to give Uh, if you'd rather text you can text 906-205-0188 906-205-0188 and you can set up uh, through a secure texting believe it or not very secure uh, you can set up uh, just one time your account information, and then from that point forward, you just put an amount like one zero zero to give a hundred dollars, and uh, you can have the convenience of texting from your smartphone. Uh, so, in any way you choose, though, if you were blessed by this morning's service, or if you're at home and you're blessed by this online service, let us know and help us to continue in this ministry. We have one last song to sing. So I invite you to stand and sing with us.